Okay, it says I am now live. I want to do a check for uh, people who are attending this. Can someone in the general chat give me a thumbs up that we are in fact live? Any of the attendees? Well, time's a wasting, so I'm hoping. Here we go, folks. Hey, y'all. I am John Powderly, uh, and I am the Grants and Planning Outreach Specialist with FEMA Region 9. It's a little bit after two now, and welcome to the Floodplain Management and Tribes breakout session. Thank you very much for being here. We have three great presenters today. First, Mike Mirzwa is with the State of California's Department of Water Resources. He's also the state's floodplain manager. He will be providing information on how California manages their floodplains. Next, Eric Simmons is a hydraulic engineer with FEMA Region 9. He is responsible for mapping flood hazard areas, and he'll explain that process and the benefits to your community. Finally, Serena Chung is a floodplain management specialist with FEMA Region 9. She is responsible for ensuring community compliance with NFIP standards and also providing technical assistance regarding the NFIP to communities. Now, the way we've got this structured is we're going to do our presentations first, and then after the presentations, we're going to be answering your questions. We've timed our presentations to where we should be leaving 10 to 15 minutes for answering questions. So please, as we present, hold off uh, on, well, no, put your questions in the chat, but hold off on anticipating answers. We'll do the best we can after the presentations are done to answer your questions. I will be monitoring the chat and saving the questions as they pop up. With that, enough of me. Let's hand this over to our first presenter, Mike Mirzwa. Mike. Great. Thanks, John, and welcome everybody this afternoon to the summit where we're going to talk about floodplain management. Uh, so let me get us fired up here. Camera. There we go. I'm assuming that you can see my uh, slides there. Is that correct, John? Yes, I can see them here. Great. Okay. Uh, everybody, please uh, feel free to make use of the chats. I will not be able to see them as I go through. As John uh, introduced me, I am the uh, state floodplain manager for the uh, state of California, and I am housed within the California Department of Water Resources Division of Flood Management. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about flood risk reduction. Uh, we often, uh, as flood managers, talk about buying down risk which means you have to take a, a portfolio of actions to go through and, and buy your risk, but there's always a residual risk. And, and there's three general components of flood risk management. There's the things that we do to assess the risk so that we're aware of how much risk we have. And then the stairs that we take down from that are all of the mitigation measures uh, that can be categorized as either planning and response or the response and recovery actions that we do in green uh, to manage that active residual risk out there. But everything in blue are the things that once we're aware of the risks that we can literally do to protect ourselves, the environment and our property. Uh, floodplain management is just one of the many toolkits out there. And I put some stars about some of the typical activities that we do in floodplain management. Uh, and that is a little bit in the risk assessment. We use mapping to go through and assess our risks. And then we get into a number of other activities, primarily land use where we get into regulation, it gets into building codes, uh, you'll see retreat, uh, easements, zoning restrictions. Uh, insurance is a means where individuals uh, can actually get recovery quickly from losses. And then there are a number of other mitigation activities. And in floodplain management, those mitigation activities often are about keeping people away from water, which we often call non-structural floodplain management or non-structural flood management. Uh, but there are other things in the structural world 
on this graphic, such as reservoir floodplain storage operation, operations maintenance, uh, flood infrastructure, such as levees, channels, bypasses, culverts, pipes, et cetera. Those are things that typically are not in the floodplain management toolkit, but other flood managers worry about. But we still have to keep an eye on those. Floodplains. This is a picture that I often use to actually initiate my slides. It's a picture looking downstream uh, along the Sacramento River at the confluence of the Sacramento and American Rivers. And the reason I like this slide is while most people might think the floodplain is just this little uh, area, this park that we call Discovery Park here in Sacramento. In fact, the state capital of California is an entire floodplain. So everything in this photo is a floodplain, including one of my favorite places, West Sacramento, where uh, a baseball team that I like to go to is located in a floodplain. In fact, uh, there are a lot of floodplains in California. Unfortunately, as you can see in this map on the right, they're everywhere. And uh, the, the, the challenge is, is the majority of the uh, maps that FEMA has provided on the floodplains, most of them are over 10 years old. Uh, and a lot of the mapping efforts, particularly where we're getting into updating the maps, typically focus in on urban areas. So in the non-urban areas, you could have an older map out there. And I like to say is uh, using an old map is like drinking spoiled milk. You can do it, but it's not going to be a good outcome out there. And so when you're making decisions based on an old map, it might not represent really the risk that you have out there. The process for updating the maps takes about five to 10 years due to extensive public engagement, uh, both with the public and with community-based floodplain managers. So these are people who are familiar with uh, how to read these maps and the flood history that's in the area. And then my role at the state, my team comes in and we kind of play a middle person. Sometimes we take the federal perspective, sometimes we take the local perspective uh, in it. And it helps us actually get into some of the other areas of floodplain management later. Uh, what most people don't recognize is that 60% of California's population is in coastal areas. There's a little blue strip running down the entire state here of California. Uh, most of our population is on the coast, uh, which means they're exposed to a type of flood hazard coastal I'll talk about. And then when you get into Southern California, the bottom third of the state, 40% of the land in the 10 Southern California counties is alluvial fans. The problem was uh, alluvial fans are really difficult to map using riverine or coastal approaches. And therefore a lot of the risk that's sitting out there is unmapped uh, and uh, alluvial floodplains, they're actually larger than most riverine and coastal floodplains. They spread out. That's what the fan does out there. And uh, many of you may have heard of the Montecito fire several years ago. I don't know how many of you recognize the uh, debris flows that came out of that, but that's a, a pretty classic example out there. So real quick, I'm not going to be able to see what your answers are, but this is a picture of a town in Iowa. Uh, and what we're looking at is really where is the floodplain here? And most people would get the area that's wet there in A, well, that's a floodplain, yes. Uh, people can see some water there at letter B, that's a floodplain again. C, the field as you move further down to the bottom left of the graphic there. Yep, that's a floodplain. What about the channel itself? Absolutely. A uh, floodway is the functional part of the floodplain. Uh, so that's, that's for sure, yes, on D. E, that little community there, would it be a floodplain or not? Well, a lot of people don't want it to be a floodplain because there's insurance requirements. Uh, but in fact, if you look at this picture very closely, you can see there's a levee running at the edge of the tree line there that is actually protecting community. So it is part of a disconnected floodplain. F, that field out there, that that there's a little hint in the graphic there that you can see some elevation change and you can see some irrigation patterns perhaps. I'm pretty sure F is a floodplain, but when you get up to G, that high end of the road there, you can see it kind of curves and it starts getting a little higher. I think that's probably not a floodplain. That's F and G are kind of a judgment call, but there's a lot you can learn from photos, a lot you can learn from maps. So floodplains, I like to think and talk about that there's three basic types. There's riverine flooding. These are two photos from the 1990s, uh, both in the summer, August of 1991, of the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, uh, just upstream of the city of St. Louis. Uh, and then you can see Two years later, in August of 1993, is when we had the great floods of 1993. You can suddenly see these massive floodplains around these meandering rivers. And the problem is, is a lot of people like to live next to the river, rivers, um, but people often think they're a little safer further away from the river. And if you look here, the areas closest to the rivers, where the levees are at, are showing up green, but the areas further away, deeper in the floodplain, are actually inundated. 
uh, by the massive amounts of water coming down the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. And this is something that's universal across the entire planet is that you have these floodplains where rivers actually perch often above the floodplains. So that's one hazard uh, that we talk about, coastal flooding. Uh, these are some California pictures. Here's Imperial Beach from January, 2019. And this is a storm surge coming. So you can see the street away from the beach is inundated. Uh, there's some people walking, the street got closed. Uh, there's potentially damage to these coastal properties. And then a, a picture that I like to show is this picture of a woman running along uh, San Francisco and Barcadero. Uh, and I don't know what year this picture was taken, but this is a king tide. Uh, the king tide is the annual tide related to the relationship of the Earth, Sun, and Moon. So it's an astronomical-based phenomenon that happens technically once or twice a year. Um, so it's not every tide. But when you get into that winter solstice and a storm comes through, that on top of that gravitation uh, can bring a lot of water up there. And with sea level rise, this is a growing problem out there, uh, knowing that downtown San Francisco is right there. And then the last, the, the type of floodplains that are often forgotten are alluvial flooding. And uh, this is a great photo of uh, Death Valley, California. And you can see the fan spreading out there. Um, that's sort of a classic fan. And then uh, th this is now a photo on the right-hand side, literally of uh, the consequences of what happens when you have flooding in these alluvial areas is you can get into uh, debris flow or mud flows. Um, you know, these all cause massive amounts of damages. And it really uh, depends upon how much that water can move the sediment and material out there. Uh, but these are really hard to map and it can clog the normal channels, which leads to the braiding that you see in the photo on the right. So uh, one of the tools that we have to address this in floodplain management is the National Flood Insurance Program. And Eric and Serena will talk much more about this. I like to think of it as a four-legged stool. So there's four components, National Flood Insurance Program. Well, there's maps involved. This is a map of Davis, California. You can see my hometown or my house there in red. Uh, you can see that I live in what we call a zone X area. So I have a uh, minimal risk of flooding, uh, but you can see I'm really close to some of these A zones, which are areas within a 100 year floodplain. There's regulation. The areas that are in the blue, those regulated areas, they have a mandatory insurance requirement for new property. And Serena will talk about that. Insurance, I, I talked a little bit about that. Uh, you can get insurance through the National Flood Insurance Program. You can sometimes get insurance through lenders. And then the last leg of the stool is mitigation. Uh, there's a lot that we do as floodplain managers to literally protect people. And you can protect people by keeping water away from them or keeping them away from water are the, the primary ways. And Eric will talk a little bit about that. So at the Department of Water Resources, uh, we have a mission statement, and that is to increase the awareness and provide technical and financial assistance to California communities and individuals so they can manage residual flood risk that remains after the implementation of structural flood defense systems. And there's four pillars that we use for that. We use flood risk assessment, similar to that stair-step graphic. Awareness, we're talking about it. We're sharing the maps that come out of the assessment. Financial assistance, we actually at the Department of Water Resources have grant programs. We have one that's live right now that'll close at the end of the month called the Floodplain Management Protection and Risk Awareness Program, which is part about taking action and it has a separate pot of money to do planning to eventually get to action later. And then integrated flood planning and management. This is where we uh, identify those risks and talk about the future needs for investment in flood risk reduction measures. So those are the four pillars. If you line them up, uh, our pillars, which are our organizational structure, along the key activities within the NFIP, those four-legged stools, mapping, regulation, insurance, and mitigation, you'll see that there's there's an alignment there. We just talk about it a little bit different just based on the skill sets of the people who are implementing those four key activities. But really, they all together represent floodplain management. Uh, in 1994, there's a great document called the Unified National Program for Floodplain Management. It's a federal document that is required by law to be updated periodically by this group called the Federal Interagency Floodplain Management Task Force. We call it the FIFM TIF to kind of make it fun. Uh, but what they do is they set up guidance not only for all federal agencies on how you prioritize federal investments, but they also guide states and local communities. So out of that document is this concept called the wise use of floodplains. 
And if there's one thing you take away from uh, this presentation is, is that as floodplain managers, this is really our sacred oath. And that is that we not only do things to protect human life and property, but we recognize the natural functions of floodplains actually reduce risk too. So when we make a wise use of a floodplain, not only we do something to protect people, but we try to protect the environment too. So that often puts a floodplain manager sometimes against some of the other areas of floodplain management, like the levee builders. Um, and then in 2002, so nearly 20 years ago, the uh, state of California pulled together a floodplain management task force where we had three theme themes, and that is to understand the risk, so that's awareness, multi-objective management for floodplains, that's where that wise use of floodplains really gets promoted, and that DWR, they said DWR, my agency, the Department of Water Resources, should provide technical, financial, and legislative assistance. So they wanted us to grow uh, the floodplain management services of the state of California. And uh, those recommendations were uh, encapsulated in a 2005 white paper, so uh, contiguous with Hurricane Katrina, and then finally in this document called the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. But I go back to this when I'm actually managing my program. So what can I do for you today? Well, right off the bat, if you need expertise, you can talk to FEMA or you can talk to your state floodplain managers and we can help. Number two, we do have some additional financial resources, grant programs that are separate from uh, FEMA programs, but they align with them. And so you can use state money to actually meet the non-federal cost share of some of FEMA's um, hazard mitigation assistance grants. And then finally, um, there are a lot of other things that we do to promote awareness. In fact, next week is going to be the California Flood Preparedness Week. And we've been working a year with communities across the state to really help them organize their local events. So it's a bottom-up process, but we help facilitate them, give them the uh, suggestions on what the topics could be, videos, and bring them together with other local managers so they can borrow ideas from each other. So John, that's all I had uh, for my presentation. And I'm going to, uh, I guess, turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Great information. Just a quick reminder to folks uh, that we're going to handle questions at the end, but please, if uh, you have any questions, put them into the chat. We will be tracking them and uh, doing our best to answer them after all the presentations are done. Next up is Mr. Eric Simmons, uh, hydraulic hey, engineer thanks. with FEMA. Yeah, thanks, John and, and Michael. Great introduction and, and kickoff to this session. And um, what I want to do is, is try to explain a little bit my work on mapping flood hazards, and we have a couple slides, um, but to you know, really talk about mapping of flood hazards, um, that introduction Michael provided on floodplains is great, and and really there's some basics on those floodplains uh, that that we want to cover. Um, slides help, but not important. You know, re realizing as as Michael said, you know, there's coastal floodplains, there's riverine, alluvial. Uh, sometimes the flooding is shallow. In certain cases, especially the Central Valley, the flooding could be very, very deep. Uh, flooding could be over weeks or flash flooding can come and go uh, for just, just a little bit. Um, so some of that impacts uh, FEMA mapping and, and you know, realize that flood hazards are, are mapped for really all floodplain management purposes. Uh, FEMA with the emphasis on uh, reducing future damages, um, you know, it's a big emphasis there. But there's also the natural and beneficial functions of floodplains, um, realizing that these areas, um, you know, floodplain storage helps reduce downstream flood elevations. Uh, there's a lot of recreational opportunities. Um, you know, there's habitat, endangered species. Uh, things like that. Uh, so I'm not sure if you can show the the second slide there, Michael. Um, but you know, there's a there's a common quote where we we hear that floods are usually an act of nature, uh, but flood damages are an act of man. And we've seen flood damages and flood losses only increase um, through our time. And and it's it's a huge nationwide program. Uh, so what do we what do we do? Um, well, the mapping is really the foundation of the National Flood Insurance Program, which we'll hear a little bit more, uh, but it's vital for implementing all flood risk management uh, standards. 
Um, so thanks for that slide there. And, and those, you know, as, as Michael mentioned, the Unified National Program, there's ways to modify our susceptibility to flooding. That is, uh, you know, building codes and requirements, um, modify the impact, such as flood insurance, you know, having had to work many, many disasters, um, it's, it's horrible when somebody loses their possessions or their house is damaged, but when they can't afford to recover, uh, the impacts are, are much worse. Um, there's structural ways to modify the flooding, levees, for example, and protecting the natural and beneficial functions of floodplains is kind of a solution and, and a strategy. Um, so looking at the, the next slide, uh, where FEMA has mapped flood zones and, and identified these, these floodplain areas, um, you know, the, the area that gets most of the focus is this high risk flood zone. Um, it has a kind of a bureaucratic term, special flood hazard area. Uh, but on this graphic here, you can see it shaded in, in blue. And, and um, that's the 1% annual chance flood. In some rivering areas, the especially important part of that 1% uh, annual chance floodplain is called the regulatory floodway. And, uh, and that's an area that has certain floodplain management criteria in communities that participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, you can also see a moderate hazard area here. In this case, it's this orange shaded area. And then the, the unshaded area is that low hazard area. It's typically outside the 0.2% annual chance floodplain or the 500-year the floodplain. Uh, but back to that high-risk area, um, in, in many of these flood zones, FEMA has identified the base flood elevation. That is the, the elevation we expect the flood of the 1% annual chance flood to get to. Um, and, and, and that's an important term for building decisions, um, insurance also. And, you know, that's kind of a summary of what FEMA's maps um, that are available for most parts of the nation um, are out there. Uh, something to, to you know, emphasize though, um, a lot of rural areas have not been um, studied by FEMA. Uh, that includes tribal nations. That's something that I think historically FEMA has not done a very good job with, uh, but it's an emphasis on uh, new efforts. Um, so going to the next slide, there's a risk map program. And, and uh, this is an evolution of FEMA's flood hazard mapping. Um, community coordination and, and technical assistance is, is built into this. So, so with new efforts and, and coordination, we're, we're trying to be more proactive in, in coordinating and consulting with tribal nations and, and realize it's not the mapping alone that's the, the result. You know, FEMA does these studies, does the flood insurance rate maps to ensure that future development is, is safer. Uh, also promoting actions that reduce risk that could be projects or community engagement, public awareness. And so um, this program risk map kind of combines all those, all those together and, and tries to move forward um, and, and most of that mapping is done to support the National Flood Insurance Program, but we also do mapping um, for some communities or tribal nations uh, that is a non-regulatory product. It could be things like depth grids or, or other flooding besides that 1% annual chance floodplain that's the base for the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, so my last slide here is, is something I wanna promote is we have, and FEMA has a national flood hazard layer. So all the digital mapping that FEMA's done, it's, it's done in a geographic information system and it's available online. Um, so there's a couple of links there. Uh, I know these PowerPoints and, and slides are available and downloaded in the system, uh, but you can go on a map viewer and see what FEMA has. You can download these products on FEMA's Map Service Center. Uh, so there's a, a website there at the beginning. You can also 
take this digital information, and if you have a geographic information system or a digital mapping system, you can play around with it, um, do your own queries and analysis, and 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 use it use it that way. So just wanted to um, you know highlight those aspects, but also if you have a FEMA flood hazard mapping question, feel free to reach out to me. Of course, we'll take your questions and and enter them in the chat now. Uh, but if your tribal nation is interested in in working with FEMA or having FEMA uh, do a flood hazard study, uh, we welcome that. Um, Fortunately, with this risk map program the past many years, we've been well-funded uh, to do new studies. There's a period where uh, FEMA really didn't receive money to do hazard studies, uh, but the past several years, we've been well-funded, so we try to seek out new partners. Um, you know, there's other options. You know, the state, as Michael mentioned, the Corps of Engineers uh, does flood studies also and, and you know, other um, localities. Uh, so just a quick introduction on FEMA flood hazard mapping. I wanted to hand it next to Serena to talk about the National Flood Insurance Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Serena, as you know, you're up. And okay. we're just waiting for Mike to transition the slides. Okay, great. Um, well, hi, everyone. My name is Serena Chung, and I'm a floodplain management specialist at FEMA Region 9, which is based in Oakland, California. I hope everyone's doing well and healthy and safe during this time. Um, so now that Michael and Eric have covered FEMA's mapping of flood hazards and flood risks, we can discuss the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP. Next. Um, so I'm going to address three main questions. Um, one is, what is the NFIP? Two is, why is the NFIP beneficial to our community? And three, how does a community join the NFIP? So the NFIP is a mitigation program, which was established by Congress in 1968 and is administered by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. Um, which is an agency under the Department of Homeland Security. So when we say mitigation, what we really mean is that it aims to reduce the negative effects. So we're talking the, the physical and financial impacts that flooding can have on our homes, families, and communities. Um, and that's through the availability of flood insurance and through effective floodplain management. Um, the program was created in response to the rising costs of flood disaster relief, and in particular to Hurricane Betsy, which hit Florida and the Gulf Coast in 1965 and had severe loss of life and property. Prior to the NFIP, um, most homeowners insurance policies actually didn't cover flood damage, and the recovery from flooding was very costly. So with this act of Congress, the NFIP made affordable flood insurance available for the very first time from the federal government. Um, and as you can see from the graphic, it may, might not seem like much, but actually one inch of water can cause $25,000 of damage to your home. Um, participation in the NFIP is completely voluntary. It's a partnership between communities and the federal government. So FEMA provides flood risk maps and access to flood insurance. And in exchange, communities agree to adopt and enforce floodplain management regulations, which ultimately help reduce and manage flood risk. So while the NFIP is voluntary, there are definitely ramifications if a community decides not to participate. So for instance, federal flood insurance is not available. Um, you also might not be able to get a loan from a federally backed institution um, for structures that are in those high risk flood zones. And federal grants might not be available to repair buildings in those high risk flood zones. Um, I've provided the Code of Federal Regulations citation for the NFIP regulations, um, which is 44 CFR. And while it's, it might seem like a very dense resource, it's a really good foundation um, for you to understand the program. So these buildings and an NFI participating community must comply with these standards based on the type of uh, flood data that FEMA has made available on those maps. 
Next. So I just mentioned one of the reasons the NFIP was established, which was due to those uh, rising costs of flood disasters. And in fact, floods are the most common and costliest natural disaster in the United States. And 98% of US counties have been flooded at one time or another. So it's really important I mean, it can rain, it can flood. Um, and if you have a 30 year mortgage on a house in one of those high risk flood zones or special flood hazard areas, you have a roughly one in three chance of being flooded uh, at least once during that 30 year period. Um, but some promising news is that according to analysis um, done by the National Institute of Building Sciences, natural hazard mitigation saves $6 on average for every dollar spent on federal mitigation grants. And then as you can see on the, the graphic on the right for riverine flooding specifically, um, the benefit cost ratio is slightly higher at $7 saved for every dollar spent on federal uh, mitigation grants. So we're here today to talk about how the National Flood Insurance Program and a community's participation in the program can make a community safer from flooding and more resilient. So two things that I really want um, to emphasize and I hope you take away from our presentation is that, you know, one is the value of the National Flood Insurance Program and how you as an individual and as well as a community can become safer from flood risks um, by participating in the NFIP. And two, to know that FEMA and the state, I know we just have California present here today, but we also have state partners from Arizona, Nevada, and Hawaii. But we in your community are definitely we're here to support you and your community. Um, if you're interested in developing a floodplain management program or if you're interested in our other mitigation opportunities. Next. So the, the flood insurance program has three main goals. The first goal is to protect lives and property from flooding. The second goal is to make flood insurance available. Um, as long as you live in an NFIP participating community, whether you're a renter, homeowner, or business owner, you can purchase flood insurance um, to ensure both the value of your home and personal property from costly flood damage. And then the third goal is to reduce the financial burden of federal disaster assistance for flood damage. Um, flood insurance is designed to provide an alternative to federal disaster assistance. And as you may know, federal disaster assistance is available only if the president declares a major disaster. So with a flood insurance policy, your home is covered even if a disaster is not declared. That way people can recover more quickly after a flood event. And just to compare um, the average FEMA Region 9 individuals and households program award amount was just over 2000 versus the average NFIP flood insurance claim payment, which was just over 25,000. Next. Um, so due to time, I'm just gonna quickly highlight some of the most important figures on the NFIP. There are currently over 22,000 communities in the US that participate in the NFIP. Next. And then of which 674 um, NFIP communities are in FEMA Region 9. Um, and that spans the states of Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, and then the Pacific territories of American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, or CNMI, and Guam, and along with 157 tribes. Uh, we currently have five tribes that participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, three of which are in California, um, one is in Arizona, and one in Nevada. Next. So now we're gonna briefly discuss, uh, discuss why the NFIP is beneficial. So communities seek to join the NFIP for various reasons, and here are the four most common benefits. The availability and affordability of flood insurance. Um, communities often join the program because they recognize the need um, and benefit for flood insurance. Uh, access to additional federal financial assistance is another important consideration. Um, communities that participate in the NFIP have access to additional federal grants and loans that non-participating communities don't qualify for. Three, um, knowing where flood hazards exist is also a benefit. 
Um, knowing and understanding your community's flood risk is really the first step towards making your community safer and more resilient. And then another benefit is knowing what kind of regulations will help prevent future losses. So adopting and enforcing the NFIP minimum standards helps communities become more resilient and safer from flood risk. Um, as we have just discussed, um, one of the primary benefits of the NFIP, oh, sorry, next slide, um, is the availability of and so I want to briefly talk about why buying flood insurance is important. So first, flood insurance can be purchased by anyone um, so long as you live in an NFIP participating community. So again, it's the homeowners, renters, business property owners who can all purchase flood insurance. Um, flood insurance is easily accessible. The same person who sells you your home or your auto insurance can also sell you your flood insurance policy. Flood insurance policies are relatively affordable. Um, FEMA has actually launched a new pricing methodology called Risk Rating 2.0, which went effective on October 1st. And that enables FEMA to deliver rates that are actuarially sound, equitable, easier to understand, and better reflect a property's flood risk. Flood insurance also puts you in control. So flood insurance claims are paid even if a disaster is not declared by the present. And then flood insurance policies are continuous, meaning they are not canceled if you have any repeat flood losses. And lastly, flood insurance reimburses you for up to $250,000 for residential structures and $100,000 for residential contents, and up to $500,000 for business or non-residential um, non structures and contents. Next. So now that we've answered what the NFIP is and why it's um, we can now discuss uh, how a community goes about joining the NFIP. So if a community is interested in joining the NFIP, they will have to first complete an application form. Um, they'll also need to adopt a resolution of intent to participate and a commitment to recognize and plan for flood hazards. Um, they will also need to adopt and submit floodplain management regulations that either meet or exceed the minimum NFIP standards, and the community will also adopt any maps that FEMA has developed to regulate too. Um, I've also provided a link on participating in the NFIP, so when you have um, the slide deck open, you can click on it, um, and it's a hyperlink, uh, and you can go directly to the website. Um, I've also provided in the top right corner is the 44 CFR reference of our requirements to join. Um, and I've definitely simplified the steps to join and you know we went quickly over the benefits of the NFIP, but I do need to acknowledge that there are obviously a lot of considerations and other factors that a community um, needs to weigh and understand before deciding to participate in the NFIP. Um, the process does take some time and, uh, of course, a lot of uh, administrative work. So it's really important to understand the roles and responsibilities of a participating community, such as requiring a permit system um, so that you can review permits in those mapped um, high risk flood zones. So I don't want to you know, mislead anyone um, that the process is super simple and easy. And, you know, there's certainly a lot of considerations and a lot of information that I could provide you with um, if your community is interested at all in participating in the program. Um, I know, you know, we are really passionate um, and do believe in the mission of the National Flood Insurance Program and mitigating flood risk in order to keep people safer. Um, so that's why we're really excited to talk to you about the program today. But you know, obviously it's up to the community to determine whether or not participating in the NFIP is truly in the best interest of the community and your community members. Um, but I do encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions and walk you through the process. So next, um, one of the last things I wanted to share with you is a list of some helpful resources um, that pertain to the NFIP. So there's you know, a lot that I could say um, about the program, um, but you can just simply click on some of those hyperlinks um, when you, when again, when you have the slide deck open um, and you can learn more about the, the program. So they're broken up into four categories. First are just some general resources. There's a link to that 44 CFR. Um, the next category is mapping resources, um, which uh, includes that map service center that Eric talked about. 
Um, the third section is on outreach and insurance. So you can actually order public awareness materials from FEMA and they're all free. Um, there's also a helpful video series um, and all of this helps explain the value of flood insurance and also help answer some program related questions. And then the last section is some training opportunities that FEMA offers. Um, there's free online independent study courses. And if you're interested in getting your certified floodplain management certification, um, there's a link to that website as well. Um, so with that, um, I also just wanted to share my contact information. Again, my name is Serena Chung and please uh, feel free to reach out to me at any point and I'm happy to meet with you. Um, so now we're at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for attending our session and I'll turn it over back to John. Thank you so very much, Serena. Great presentation. Thank you for that information. To the attendees, um, I, I'm noticing that there's not any questions uh, posted in the session chat, at least none that I can see. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them now and we will do the best we can to answer them. Uh, if there are no questions, then in you know, I'm going to wait about 15, 20 seconds for questions because I sense there may be a, a, a lag on this system. But if there is, are no any questions, then I'm going to hand it back to each of the panelists for a quick two minute uh, summary. You know, what are the important points that you want uh, the attendees to leave with uh, from this presentation. And as Mike mentioned, yes, there are polls in the chat as well. Going once. Going twice. Mike Mirzwa, I will go and close the polls because people, uh, for those who are attended, we should be able to present the results to them. I will go and close the polls while you begin with your uh, two minute recap. What do you want folks to know, the attendees to know from your presentation? Thanks, John. Uh, a couple things. First, from the perspective of the state of California, you don't necessarily have to be an NFIP community to still get services from the state. We do, of course, want you to participate in NFIP. And so we're gonna constantly guide you that direction but there's a lot more to floodplain management. And Serena used the magic words. When you become a community in the NFIP, they want you to meet or exceed the standards of the NFIP. So we're gonna constantly push the envelope. That goes to that wise use concept. Uh, second thing, I'm gonna do three here. The second thing is the MAP Service Center. FEMA's MAP Service Center is excellent. Uh, anytime a project application or question comes to my group, I've trained my team. I have about 40 engineers and scientists working for me. I go to that map service center and I look to see what those maps are, knowing that some of them might be old, uh, but some of them might be new, but they still tell you a lot about what's happening out there. And it allows you to really think about how are you gonna mitigate your risk? Do you wanna live right there? Uh, do you wanna do something else? This is a great place to put an ecosystem investment or a farm. Um, is this a great place to put a recreational, like a trail? All of those are things that you will really wanna look at when you see those maps out there. Knowing, of course, like I said earlier, that the maps are really predominantly in California, really good in the riverine and coastal areas. When you get the alluvial, you're going to have to look not just at the map service center, but you're going to have to look at some of the Google Earth and other tools out there. And then the, the last thing out there, and Serena covered it, is uh, we really want you to get insurance. We don't care if it's a national flood insurance program policy or someone else's, but those numbers of that chance of having flooding coming through to your house, um, those are pretty scary. And it, if baseball players had batting averages, that were as good as those averages that you're gonna have flooding over the course of your 30 year mortgage. We would see postseason play lots of uh, grand slams and hits all the time uh, because those are pretty good odds that you're gonna get the flood event. And what the insurance does is it allows you to recover long before your local government, your county government, your state government, or your tribal community can go through and, and get those resources to bear. Uh, there's just a lot of due process associated with the larger things. Thanks, John. Thank you, Michael. Thank you much. Eric, Yeah. your turn. Sure. Well, appreciate the, the baseball reference, um, but understanding floodplains, um, really understanding um, the hazard, you need, you need a map. So we use maps every day for, for driving or 
for other things. But uh, if you want to look at ways to reduce future losses and, and build safer, having a good and accurate flood hazard map is really key. So I want to stress that. And, and FEMA wants to help all communities understand their hazard. And we work with uh, many communities on communicating the risk and, and benefits. So if there's questions you have on that, if, if you um, need flood hazard data, uh, a new study, for example, please reach out. Uh, we, we welcome those questions. And let me hand it to, to Serena for, for the last comment. Um, yeah, I would just like to emphasize, you know, the National Flood Insurance Program really is designed to mitigate your flood risk. Um, and you saw that we have relatively low participation amongst tribal nations within our region. So if you're at all curious about the program, um, I'm happy to sit down with you and spend a little bit more time about, you know, discussing the program um, and walking you through you know, the steps to join. Um, so I really do encourage you to reach out to me. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Serena. Um, Serena, your contact information is in the presentations. I apologize, uh, Michael and Eric, did you include your contact information in your presentations? Okay. Hi. Could you please, both of you, post your emails? Would that be okay if you post your emails in the chat? If for some reason you um, don't aren't able to pull their emails from the chat, uh, you can always contact me and I will forward you their contact information as well. Excellent. And also for uh, folks who would like those presentations, those presentations have been uploaded to Excelevance under this breakout session. And all the links in those presentations are live as of today. So there should be no dead links if you are going through the presentation and you see a document that you'd like to access, click on the link and it should be pulled up in whatever web browser you are using. Michael, Eric, I see your contact information. And there still are no questions, which is okay. That must mean that we answered all the questions that the attendees had. I will give another 30 seconds or so. Otherwise, attendees, thank you very much. That concludes our presentation. And we hope you have a wonderful conference. And again, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters to get information that you feel would help your community regarding flood risk and flood insurance. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.